Matthew chapter 3, we'll pray and begin. God, thank you for the ability to surrender everything to you, Lord, and to walk together as brothers and sisters, looking unto you, Lord, waiting upon you for your best, not, not just good, but your best. And sometimes, Lord, you put us in the waiting room for a really long time, and you're working on our hearts. You're forming in within us the ability to fully receive the calling that you have for us, and we don't want to shrink back from that, Lord. We don't want to despise the days of small things. We don't want to grow weary in waiting. We, we want to just continually surrender this to you and, and trust you for your timing. You're just so good, and you're always right. And so we thank you, Lord. Uh, bless our time together in your word today, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So for 400 years, God had been silent. For 400 years, God hadn't said a thing. For 400 years, God was not speaking to his people. That 400 years started when God poured out his heart to his people, as recorded in the book of Malachi. Do you remember when we went through Malachi last December? How we went through the book of Malachi and how we saw seven times God poured out his heart. And how seven times after he poured out his heart, God's people responded with dismissive or deflective, disrespectful questions, dishonest questions. And God was hoping that his people would, re would respond to his pouring out of his heart, that they would recognize their heart condition, and that they would have responded in heartfelt repentance after the identification of their sin. But instead, they got defensive, and they were dismissive, they were disrespectful, and they were honestly just dishonest. His questions were deflective. They knew that God was saying the truth. And yet they were somehow trying to avoid conviction, an honest assessment, and repentance. And so when God said to them something as simple as, I have loved you, his people responded with, how have you loved us? Whoa, what's going on? And then God goes further and says, listen, you're, you're disrespecting my name. In what way have we disrespected your name? You, you defiled the worship of God. In what way did we defile the worship of God? You keep pouring out words to me, but I don't see that your actions follow your words. Your heart is far away from what you're saying. In what way have we done that? Return to me, and I will return to you, God says. In what way shall we return? Listen, you need to know you've robbed me. In what way have we robbed you? Guys, your words, listen to your words. Your words are out of order. You're forgetting who you're talking to. God could have ended them, and he didn't. He said this to them gently, and yet each and every time they responded to him, in what way have we done these things to you? Seven attempted corrections and seven deflections with these questions. Seven times that God poured out his heart. Seven God-given merciful opportunities to repent, to turn away from sin and turn towards the Lord, to come clean and to come back to the heart of worship. And yet they refused over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. So what was God's response to all of this? God went silent. God went silent for a really long time. God went silent for 400 years. And the last thing that he said to his people just before going silent was this. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send to you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So those were his last words before he went quiet, before he went silent. He was reminding them of the law. Don't forget the law. The law that lets you know where you fall short. 
Remember the law, for judgment is coming. The great and dreadful day of the Lord is coming. And yet, mercifully, before that day, I will send a man who will help your hearts to prepare for that day by turning your hearts away from sin and turning your hearts to the Lord. This is how you prepare for judgment day. Turn from sin and turn towards the Lord, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So that's how the Old Testament ends. And then God goes silent for 400 years until a man comes, sent by God, In the wilderness, a man who was the last of the old covenant prophets, not Malachi, a man named John. And even though his life is recorded for us in the New Testament, he's the last of the old covenant prophets. And he had a word from the Lord for God's people. And what was the first word of the word from the Lord for God's people? Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You can see that in the first two verses of Matthew chapter 3. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. John, in the wilderness, finally God is speaking. And this is what God says. Repent. Turn your heart to the things of God. Turn your heart to God. For the kingdom of God is at hand. It's, it's, It's as close as your hand It's not in some distant mystical land. It's not a long way off. It's time right here and right now to repent, to turn from sin and turn towards the Lord. And this was the word that God had for his people. This was the first word that God had for his people after pouring out his heart and after going silent for such a long time because his heart was rejected. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And God sent this word through a man, through a messenger, similar to Malachi, but at a different time. So Malachi was just before God went silent. John is right after God goes silent. And what was different about this time? Why was it that the kingdom of God was at hand, like as close as your hand, not in some distant land, not a far away off? Why was it at hand? Well, it says, at this time, John came. What was going on at this time? Jesus, the king of the kingdom that's at hand, was already born. Jesus, the king of the kingdom, had been born. So the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And so John, with a word from the Lord, says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now we ask the question, what does it mean to repent? What does it mean to repent? It's a word that's charged, isn't it? It's a word that conjures up pictures in your mind. It's a word that's been hijacked by many people. It's a word that comes with a lot of connotations, but it's important to recognize what is biblical and what is cultural. The word repent is a very hopeful word because if we respond to God's invitation to repent, it means that we get to let go of things that are harming us. I'm the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. If you're willing to turn away from that thing, I'll take that thing away, and I won't just take that thing away. But times of refreshing will come. Times of healing will come. And I'll replace that thing with new, godly, holy habits that will bless you over and over and over. So that word, repent, is a very hopeful word. What does it mean? Now, some say that repent means to feel sorry for your sin. Some feel that it means to change your mind about sin. But If you think that through, we could do both of those things and not actually truly repent of our sin, right? You could feel sorry for your sin. You could mentally acknowledge that what you did was wrong. And true repentance may include these things as a precursor to true repentance, But if it's to be genuine repentance, if it's to be real repentance, it needs to be followed by the fruit of repentance. There must be a genuine turning from sin and a tangible forsaking of that sin. For if you merely feel sorry for that sin or if you merely feel sorry that you got caught in that sin, even if you acknowledge mentally that that is a sin, you can't just merely declare repentance and then continue in that sin. That's not true repentance. 
True repentance would be seen in turning away from your sin and a complete ceasing of that sin and the renouncing of that sin. And listen, a humble hatred of that sin. That's the fruit of true repentance. And genuine worshipers, genuine followers of God are willing to repent. They want to repent. And if God came to a genuine worshiper, even through a messenger, and put his finger upon someone's sin, a genuine worshiper's sin, if they're a genuine worshiper and a genuine follower, they would be quick to forsake that sin and to humbly hate that sin and to turn towards the Lord and not want to do a single sin that would hurt the heart of God. And yet, as Matthew chapter 3 begins... And God begins to speak once again. We see two different types of people. We see those who genuinely and humbly repent of their sin and forsake their sin and turn from their sin and replace their sin with new holy habits. And then we also see people who merely declare repentance from sin but don't actually do anything to turn from sin. And John addresses both of these groups. Look at verse 1 once again. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Verse 1 says this. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of the of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now, John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But, verse 7, When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, brood of vipers. (laughs) I don't think John has read the book on how to win friends and influence people. I said, brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. So after God poured out his heart and after his heart was dismissed and disrespected, God went silent. And then after that silent period, when it finally came time for him to speak to his people again, his message hasn't changed. This still needs to be dealt with. So the first word of his word is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand and bear fruits worthy of repentance. Don't just say it and not do anything about it. Repent and show your genuine repentance by the fruit of repentance, which would include, yes, feeling sorry for your sin and mental acknowledgement that it is sin, but it also will include a turning, a forsaking, a renouncing, and a ceasing of that sin. And this isn't just an Old Testament thing. This isn't just a John the Baptist thing. And again, try to rescue this word from it being hijacked and having cultural connotations. It's a very hopeful word. If God puts his finger upon something in our life that's robbing us, because remember, sin takes more than it gives, why would any of us go, "Uh uh-uh, Instead of going, really? I'm so sorry. I won't do that again. What could I do to replace that? I don't want to ever do that if that hurts your heart. Tell me more. Do you see anything else? Please. I want want to honor you, Lord. That's what a genuine worshiper, a genuine follower of Jesus would do. And this is why we see this word repent and this concept of repentance continue all the way through the New Testament. In fact, we best get used to the word repent because it's the first word of the gospel. And it's a very hopeful word. It was the first word that God spoke through John after Jesus, the Messiah, the King, was born. It's a new time. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was also the first word of Jesus when he began to preach the gospel. Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says this, Now after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The word repent was also the first word of the disciples when they began to preach the gospel. Mark 6, 12 says this. So they went out and preached that people should repent. Repent was also the first word that Jesus used when he was teaching the disciples how to preach the gospel after the resurrection. Luke 24, verses 46 and 47 says this. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Repent was also the first word of the first exhortation in the first Christian sermon after Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Repent was also the first word from the Apostle Paul when he began to preach the gospel. Listen, giving his testimony before a king, he said this, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but I declared first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Do you see that? Repent. Turn to God and do works befitting repentance. Now, some of you are thinking, and I'll tell you maybe why you're thinking this. One of the reasons why repent has such a harsh connotation that we kind of recoil from is because none of us wants to be told that we're bad. You know, like we're bad. I'm, bad. I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. I had a situation with a friend yesterday morning, and we were going through some, some counseling, and he's in a conflict, and the other party was trying to say, like, here's my concerns, and I, I want you to see these concerns. And, 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 and they were reading through the list of concerns, and this person said, am I really that bad? And I looked at him, and I said, no, you're worse. <laughs> Isn't that true compared to Christ? You're worse than anything anyone could say about you because no one sees you fully. Only Jesus sees you fully. And compared to him, man, we're at our worst right now. We all fall short. And so when he who sees us still loves us and calls us to let go of the things that are harming us, why would we hesitate? The only reason is Pride. I'm not that bad. Don't tell me to repent. The quicker you can realize that you're far worse than anything anyone could ever say to you, the faster you're going to go to those times of refreshing that come after relinquishing your sin. Turn from that which is taking from you. Turn to the one who gives to you, and he'll change your heart and give you holy habits. And it, the world will see the fruit of salvation, the fruit of genuine conversion, the fruit of genuine repentance. See, some of you are thinking, I thought we were saved by grace through faith. It seems like you're talking about works. No, I'm not. Faith alone saves. But the faith that saves is never alone. Do you understand? Faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is never alone. If someone just declares that they're a Christian, declares their conversion, but it never actually happened and you never see any change of heart, it's it's not genuine. So what we should see is a, a, a feeling of sorry 
for our sin, a remorse for our sin, a willingness to turn from our sin and to turn towards the Lord. And then he gives us something that replaces that sin, holy habits that, that give more than they cost. And then we see the result of repentance, the fruit of repentance. And that's what Paul was saying. Repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. And repentance does not merely include feeling sorry or mentally acknowledging. That's not genuine repentance. It may be a precursor to repentance, but it's not genuine repentance. Paul the Apostle talked about this in his second letter to the Corinthians, and he said this very plainly to them. If I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted. Has anybody here regretted repenting of sin? I mean, seriously. Anybody here, I regret giving up sin and turning towards the Lord because what God replaced that sin with, his holy habits that he gave me was just not as good as the sin that I turned away from. No, why would we resist? Only you and the Lord can answer that. So we, 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 we follow this over and over in our lives repentance and turning towards God and doing works befitting repentance. Listen to that verse from a few other translations. New Living Translation says this. I preach that all must repent of their sins and turn to God and prove that they have changed by the good things that they do. The Phillips Translation says this. I preach that men should repent and turn to God and live lives to prove their change of heart. The Living Bible says this. I preach that all must forsake their sins and turn to God and prove their repentance by doing good deeds. Children's Bible says this, I told them to turn away from their sins to God. The way they live must show that they have turned away from their sins. Living Bible says this, I preach that all must forsake their sins and turn to God and prove their repentance by doing good deeds. The Amplified Version says this, I preach that they should repent and turn to God and do works and live lives consistent with and worthy of their repentance. Now, for any of us who have been following the Lord for any length of time, we know that repentance doesn't, or at least shouldn't, end at the moment of conversion, at the moment of being born again. This is something that hopefully will happen again and again and again and again as Jesus lovingly and persistently reveals more and more of what he wants to remove from our lives. And as we over and over respond humbly in genuine repentance, and you all know this, and then he responds by lovingly removing what we have humbly and genuinely repented of. And then he replaces with new, wonderful, life-giving, holy habits. And hopefully this happens in our lives over and over and over again. So let's rescue this word once again and see it as a lovely, beautiful, hopeful word. Because times of refreshing happen after this word happens. Peter even said this when he was preaching in Acts chapter 3, and we'll end with this. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, washed away, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Jesus, we're so thankful that you call us to yourself again and again. We're so thankful that you, you call us away from sin and towards you and fellowship with you again and again. Lord, thinking through your letters that you wrote to those churches in Revelation, it's a word that you used again and again. 
Turn from that which is taking more than it gives. Turn towards me. Let me replace that with something that gives more than it costs. New holy habits that are consistent with our new nature. Lord, we don't want to spend another moment on our old, sinful, sad, sorry nature. Not another single second. We want to turn from our old man, forsake the old man. Turn to you and receive from you all that you have for us. Lord, please forgive us when we fold our arms and stall on repentance. Please forgive us when we give you attitude, Lord, when you're just trying to help us. Please forgive us, Lord, when we hold so tightly to something that's harming us. And all you want to do is serve us and wash us and strengthen us. And so we relax our grip once again, Lord, and we say, have your way. You bought us with your blood. We're yours. We are instruments in your hands. We don't want to wiggle. We don't want to do our own thing. We want to rest and be refreshed by your spirit as we trust you and obey you and follow you with our whole heart. Oh, we're so thankful for you, Lord. Please continue to pour out your spirit. Call us back to yourself when we're knuckleheads. Forgive us and cleanse us and put us back in the game. We love you, Lord. We worship you now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.